I'm going to talk to you today about what we do in our group, which is largely automated and autonomous experiments. Um, and what we do is we try to take scientific characterization and synthesis tools, augment them with computing and algorithms, and really try to make them, for lack of a better word, in, in quotation marks, smart. So uh, really pushing the frontiers of what scientific in instruments can actually do. Um, but to start with uh, acknowledging, uh, the, firstly, the Department of Energy and the place I work, which is the Center for Nanoface Material Sciences, it's this little building here. It's actually situated next to the Spallation Neutron Source, which is, I think, America's largest uh, neutron science facility. Um, and we are one of five nanoscience centers uh, in the Department of Energy complex. Uh, and so if you are interested in any of the things that I mentioned today, as we are a user facility, so we work kind of similar to other user facilities in the sense that it, anything that I showed today, uh, that's actually available for all users to come and access um, as long as you have a, a two-page user proposal that is accepted. So if you're interested in that, just let me know. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that are involved with this particular effort. It's actually an effort that's gone on for more than a decade or so. Um, in particular, I'd like, to all, uh, I'd like to thank the postdocs that were involved, um, Yong Tao Lu, Ayana Ghosh, who's actually in a slightly different uh, directorate in the computing directorate, but she did a lot of simulations work for us, and Arpan Biswas, who's done some of the uh, Bayesian optimization work. Nicole Kriyansh is a former postdoc of ours. Um, recently, she's left to industry, um, uh, but she's also been instrumental in some of the work that I'm going to show today. So as I mentioned, um, we are a National Science User Facility, um, and so we do a lot of things at CNMS. And if you're interested in any of, any of these things, um, please come and talk to me. I'll, I'm very happy to help you to write a proposal to access our facility free of charge. So <clears throat> as far as you know, uh, scientific instruments and scientific user facilities are concerned, um, in the last maybe five years or so, we've seen a shift where we have really had an increase in research into so-called smart experiments, whether they be at sort of beam lines and sort of phase mapping at a synchrotron. This is work by one of my, my good friends, Gilad Kuzne at NIST, um, or whether it be, for example, molecular synthesis. So this is work by the Cronin, Lee Cronin's group at Glasgow. Um, the, the idea here is that we really can accelerate the rate at which we are either synthesizing or characterizing material systems by making uh, our instruments combine with things like machine learning and algorithms and computation in a, feed, in a nice feedback loop so that we can really accelerate the rate at which either we are going to map out these compounds in, for example, these ternary structures, or whether we are going to synthesize new types of materials with optimum properties, in this case, um, molecular properties. So, what, did, what does this actually require though, right? So in order to have this kind of smart workflows, um, well, what you generally you have, you start with an instrument. In my case, this is an atomic force microscope, but it can really be any kind of instrument that's generating data for you. Once you have this stream of data, then what we want to do is we combine the data with sort of prior knowledge, which could come from simulations or it could come from the operator themselves. Maybe it's also augmented with algorithms. And this provides some knowledge about the state of the particular material under, under, uh, under interest, right? That's being probed. And so once you have this state knowledge, then you can use this to be able to provide feedback to the microscope, right? So this is kind of the overall, you know, vision is like how we can make, make these scientific characterization tools smart. So can we, you know, accelerate the rate at which we create this data? Can we accelerate the amount of state knowledge that, or increase the amount of state knowledge that we have by leveraging algorithms and simulations so that we can then feedback and, and, and improve uh, our microscope or our synthesis tool or whatever it may be. Um, and so uh, there are many ways to do this and I'll touch on some of the few ways in this talk as to how we are doing this at CNMS. Um, but one of the things for, for simulations people, because this is of course, you know, a, a workshop where we are talking about a lot of modeling is that in order to, if you look at this particular box, right, in this workflow, right, how we uh, ingest, uh, how we apply algorithms to our data sets is then how we also incorporate prior knowledge and simulations, we really have models that range from sort of fully data-driven models, so things like, you know, typical deep neural networks without any kind of regularization or anything, um, to pure physics-driven models. So this might be things like functioning, density functional theory or quantum Monte Carlo methods, really first principles methods that are purely physics-based. But in general, what we need for state knowledge is some kind of hybrid between these two particular ends of the spectrum, right? Depending on the target that we're trying to do, we might not be able to, you know, leverage the fact that we can, although we can do QMC, we can't do QMC on large systems, for example. So if we want to be able to, or maybe these, these particular physics-driven models are either too simplistic or maybe they are too, they take too much time. Uh, on the other hand, maybe these data-driven models are quite expressive and they're quite powerful. On the other hand, maybe they're not as reliable and they're not, they don't have the extrapolation 
distributed power that we need. So typically, we need to sit somewhere in between the middle of these particular you know, ends of the spectrum uh, when it comes to actual application of these uh, two scientific characterization and synthesis tools. So the tool that I'm going to talk about today is really the scanning probe microscope. And so I know not everyone here is familiar because uh, most of the people here probably are familiar with traditional imaging like electron microscopy. Um, but a scanning probe microscope is also a type of microscopy. And so it images in a slightly different way. And the way that it images is that basically we have a, a, a very uh, small cantilever, a few hundred microns. And at the end of this cantilever, we have a very sharp tip at the end, a probe. And this probe typically has a radius of around 10 nanometers. And so what we do is we, uh, we take this cantilever and we scan it over the surface. And as we scan over the surface, we bounce a laser off the back of this cantilever onto a four quadrant photodetector. And as the cantilever sort of wobbles up and down, we can measure the deflections on this photodetector to give us a, a readout of the sort of, sort of topo topographic information uh, that's present in our sample. And so we can extend this by applying different types of stimuli. So in this case, we can do, for example, mechanical or electrical stimulus to the, to the probe uh, or the sample. And then usually, you know, this can be electrical, thermal, mechanical. Um, and what, we, this, what this technique gives us, it gives us very nice uh, lateral resolution on the order of the, the probe size, which is around 10 nanometers. But interestingly, it also gives you a very sensitive uh, uh, measurements in the z direction. In other words, we can measure, measure displacements on the order of one to two picometers um, using this technique, which is really powerful. And just to give you a reference, you know, the diameter of a hydrogen atom is, uh, you know, 180 picometers or so. So this is really uh, very small displacements that are, very, that are reliably tracked through atomic force microscopy and sort of hence the name um, that it has. And so we can use this to study a wide variety of phenomena in material science, things like for electricity, ionic motion, ordering of vacancies, interfacial reactions, electro uh, electroplating, mechanics, and so forth, um, that are all p capable of being probed through this particular type of microscopy. Um, but the, the trouble with a, a lot of AFM is that typically our signal is sort of convoluted with the fact that you have this cantilever dynamics uh, that you need to measure uh, and you need to understand in order to be able to take your signal and really uh, uh, determine, uh, you need to pr pr perform some processing on it uh, so that you can hopefully give you an understanding of sort of local materials behavior. So we, we let's say, apply some stimulus to this probe. We get some spectra, spectra at that particular location, and then we build up a map of the spectra across the sample. And hopefully this leads us to some better understanding of our material system. So the goal in any scanning probe microscope is really to uh, understand the, how the, the local microstructure, which we measure, uh, correlates to the functional properties, which we also measure through the same microscope. And that's really the, the goal of really any type of microscopy. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we do often in this, with the scanning probe microscope is we uh, we, uh, at least at, at the CNMS, is when we want to probe the, um, the functional properties of materials like piezoelectrics or ferroelectric materials, we can apply these sort of complicated bias waveforms where these are sort of triangular envelopes of DC pulses um, that are applied either to the tip or the sample. And so as a function of this bias, we can then have some readout pulses which will give us the state of the system after application of each of these bias pulses. And so for a ferroelectric material, this actually returns you the hysteresis loop. This is analogous to uh, ferromagnetic materials where you get similar hysteresis loops, but we can do this at the nanoscale and so we can build up pictures of how the material is switching over, you know, nanometer, uh, nanometer sized uh, uh, samples or tens of nanometer samples. So uh, this has been going on for, you know, two, three decades now. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about now is how we can use deep learning for really improving all of the aspects that I've just shown in the scanning probe microscope. So let's start with the first one. As I mentioned before, um, in order for us to be able to interpret signals that are coming from the AFM, very often if we are working in some kind of resonant mode, then we need to understand the cantilever dynamics, right? So you have this cantilever that's resonating on the sample surface. Um, and what we have is uh, typically we have, a, a, we, we have to choose a model, and so that model might be this, you know, a very simple model, like a simple harmonic oscillator model. And so this is pretty. This is a linear system, and it's very easy to solve. And so we can uh, take our data um, that, that comes from our AFM, and we can. Uh, find per these fitting parameters for the simple harmonic oscillator model, right? And so typically what we do is we get this data and then we fit to this particular uh, model and we extract parameters such as the amplitude of the oscillation, the phase of the oscillation, the resonant frequency, um, in other words, where this amplitude is maximum, and then something called the quality factor of the cantilever, which is the full width half maximum of this particular peak. So. 
this is all well and good. Um, and so you might ask, so what is the problem, right, with this particular model? Um, the real challenge is that you can see that here, look at the phase signal, right? And this is very often happens. And all, even in the amplitude signal, you see a lot of noise, right? SPM is intrinsically a high noise technique. It has a lot of noise um, just because of the, the, the type of measurement that it is. Uh, and so the question is, how do we do this inversion, right, for these parameters in noisy environments? Right. Well, the, what we need is first we need uh, we need good priors that we use for let's say an LM algorithm to be able to determine these parameters, but we typically don't have great priors if we have very noisy data. Like our prior or starting point might be take the maximum point here as the starting point for the amplitude that you want to do when you want to do this inversion, right? But this actually doesn't work very well when you have very noisy data sets. And so the, the first thing that, um, that, we did, that we thought might be uh, worthwhile in this case was maybe we can use deep learning to help us out here. And so this is actually an idea that came from a, po from a former postdoc of ours, Nick Borodinov, who's actually at Siemens Research now and doing machine learning. Um, by the way, that happens a lot when we train microscopists to do machine learning. They go and get jobs in the industry to do machine learning, um, <laughs> uh, which is good for them. Um, and so, um, but, but we've got a nice paper out here. Uh, so what, hap what, he, what he did was he created a very simple um, neural network, which consists of uh, basically two input channels, one for the real part of the signal and one for the imaginary part. And what it does is it does nothing more than just uh, input the raw data and outputs the, the four parameters of that simple harmonic oscillator model. This is the simplest possible thing. And you might think this is stupid, right? We we went from a model which had four parameters to now a model which has, you know, thousands of parameters. This is like, why, was, why would we possibly do this, right? Um, obviously it worked, that's why I'm showing it to you. Um, so what happens here is that when we use this and we can train, because we have the forward model, we can train on as many examples as we like. We can train on millions of different examples. And so it actually works out to be really uh, a really good estimate for priors, which we can then use for our functional fits. So let me just show you how that actually looks in a real, in a real case. Um, here on the, on the top left side, you see a, a standard sort of inversion from, for, from least squares of a particular image captured at two volts, right? So this is a typical voltage that we would use to capture these kinds of images um, on ferroelectric materials. And you can see that as I go from two volts to you know, 50 millivolts, uh, using just the standard least squares method, there's a lot of noise once you get to 50 millivolts. On the other hand, if I use deep neural networks, um, without any other uh, without any other optimization, then you can see that you know you get some rel relatively good results. But actually, the best results come from a hybrid method where we use the deep neural network as the prior. So we pass our data through the deep neural net, it gives us the prior, and then we use that um, as the we use that as a starting point for the LM algorithm to give us uh, you know the optimum um, for that particular point. And so what we find is that you know we have much better fitting uh, of our spectra through these deep neural net priors. Um, we can accelerate this even more through FPGA devices so that you can actually incorporate the neural net on an FPGA so we can get fits as we stream the data. This is actually work that's being done right now by Josh Agar and Nan Tran and some of my colleagues. Yes? When you're taking the, uh, the lower uh, potential system, do you already uh, uh, show the, uh, the network the results that you had from the two-volt system? Or? No. Okay, so this no. is... No, the, the, the network is trained on purely stimulated data. It, it has no access to the real data. It's because it's a forward model and it, you know, it's a relatively good model, uh, then we don't need to show any real data to the system, yeah. So you can see that you know, we can image even at 50 millivolts, which for a lot of, uh, you know, if you, if you look at, if you, if you actually ask you know, sort of experts who do this kind of imaging on a daily basis, you know, m m most of them will, will think this is all noise because this is what they would see in their system, right? They would not be able to see that, that there actually is a signal here. So I think that was quite, kind of a nice thing. And the other thing here is that, you know, we, we've set it up so that we can actually run this, you know, um, on a cluster and so we can get fits line by line as it come through the microscope. So at every line here, this passes through, this is actually sent to a GPU server. It does the inference, it does the fit and it sends the fit back and then we plot it in real time. And so this is what you see uh, when we have this inline on the microscope. Um, we can do better than this, of course. Um, there are other ways to get priors and the things uh, for spectra. And the reason and the, the way that we can get better priors is that 
Typically, when we collect spectra, we're not collecting just one spectra at a particular position, right? We're collecting spectra across a dense grid. And so um, the, what we uh, typically estimate is that if you are at a particular position and you get a spectra, then surrounding positions, nearest neighbors, are likely to have very similar spectra, right? So what you can do is you can do something like, for example, a nearest neighbor averaging to, be, to improve your signal to noise. And so we can, if we take nearest neighbor averages of our spectra, and then we fit to those spectra, to that particular average spectra, and propagate the results of that fit to the individual spectra themselves as the priors, then that actually results in sli slightly better improved spectral fits. Now, um, a, 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 so this is called the sort of nearest neighbors approach. We can also use a k-means approach where we can do clustering of the data, and then we can fit to the cluster centroids, and then we can propagate that uh, propagate the results of that fit to the cluster members. And there's also a sort of hierarchical approach which you can, we can use. But basically, uh, we are here leveraging the fact that we have so many different spectra um, that are collected across the grid of points um, to be able to pr uh, improve the priors that are used for functional fits. Because mod for spectra like this, this particular kind of spectra that we capture has about 13 parameters in our phenomenological fitting function. And if you don't, if you don't start with good priors for these kinds of uh, uh, functions, you're not going to get relative, you're not going to get good fits. So. Just to show that this actually works, um, this is the result um, you know, on, uh, for, this is the R squared value for the fit versus the, the data for, different type, for these different types of uh, uh, prior propagation methods. And so the k-means method actually works really well. And you can see that you know, in terms of time taken, the k-means method works um, rather, rather quickly compared to the other methods. And it has a nice R squared as well. So you can sort of see that in sort of typical hysteresis loops that we are fitting here. Anyway, that's just an aside that was work that was done by Nicole Criange. Um, but uh, this, is, this was the things that we were doing maybe three, four years ago. And so when we started to apply machine learning to, to our SPM techniques, we discovered that what we needed to do is we needed an ability to really control the SPM or really control our microscopy uh, through an abstraction layer. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we need to be able to control the SPM through code right, that we can write and that, that is very, that has relative, it's relatively low level, uh, but has full access to all of the controls that the SPM actually provides through its traditional, you know, GUIs. Um, and so you see this in, in digital chemistry, for example, uh, the so-called computation, uh, which, is, uh, which is by the Cronin group, Lee Cronin's group. And so what they did was they basically digitized chemistry in a way where uh, they can represent any kind of molecular reaction through a particular programming language which they call KITL. The point is that this abstraction allows them to provide automation and that's what we need. We need, an, we need, a, we need a system that allows us to automate our microscopy so that we can then apply better machine learning algorithms to it. Right? And so you see this also happening on the microscopy side. This is Picro Manager, which is typically used for optical microscopy systems. Um, and so the idea the idea here is that rather than having users have to deal with the actual hardware, the hardware itself, if you have users to focus on the abstraction, in other words, to be able to just design their experiment through code and they don't have to worry about the hardware implementation, then we can actually start to focus more on the science itself. Okay. So we actually did that at the CNMS, and the way that we do it is um, either we use a national instruments card, so this is an FPGA device um, uh, that we can actually use to actually to output signals that go to the piezos, they can control the piezos, um, and they also control the output to the cantilevers that, uh, and, and the tips. Um, and so we can also read in the signals through this device. And so effectively, this acts as an SPM controller. The only thing the SPM is doing for us is maintaining feed, uh, Z feedback, but otherwise it's not doing anything else. And so we take over the system um, through this FPGA device. And when we actually want to uh, do an experiment, all I'm doing is I'm writing lines of code to do an experiment. Um, and so this is very easy for us to put in, for example, optimization loops, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the power of these kinds of abstractions. And so we can actually run this on multiple different instruments so that the code is the same and the, the hardware connection layer sort of takes care of the, um, it, the, of the instructions that are actually sent to the different instruments that we have. So what can we do with this kind of system? I'm going to show you one example, which is by one of our students, um, Sai Mani Valetti from, from UTK, uh, from University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And so uh, one of the things that um, we, we thought might be very interesting to study is um, domain walls in ferroelectric materials. So what you see here is an amplitude image from a piezo response force microscopy scan of a, a, a sample of lead titanate. Um, the lead titanate sample comes from Jiangxi Yang from, from Taiwan. The point here is that we can draw domain walls 
in the system by just scanning the tip at different potentials. Uh, and then what we wanted to do is we wanted to understand how the domain wall uh, responds to different applications of, of voltage. So how would we do that? So typically the way that you would do that is you would go ahead and uh, uh, position your tip at different positions. You would apply a particular voltage pulse and then you'd go to image it and then you can um, get some data this way. But now because we have an automated system, we can actually get a huge amount of data. And the way that we can do this is, for example, for, we can choose a line. In this case, this is, let's say, the third line. And what we do is uh, we scan this particular same line over and over again over time. And so this is, a, this is the same line that's imaged over time. But what, I'm doing, uh, what we're doing here is that after every three lines or so, a bias is applied. In other words, a voltage is applied at this particular domain wall, and this voltage is actually increasing in magnitude for subsequent times, right? And so what we see is that initially for, you know, as you apply some voltage, nothing much happens. The wall is sort of stuck, and the reason it's stuck is because it's pinned by defects that are, that are present within our film. Uh, after, after a particular voltage threshold is reached, you can start to see the wall is starting to displace, right? And so we can very reliably extract the local depinning threshold by this particular automated experiment. I'll show you what that looks like in, in terms of the, the actual, uh, if we actually fit like sort of, uh, uh, sort of Gaussians to, to find the actual position of the domain wall in this experiment, you can see that initially it's sort of flat. There's nothing really that much happens because the wall is not responding to the, to the fields that we're applying, it's too small. But then what you see is that uh, after a particular threshold is reached, that the wall starts to move. And so you can, very quickly determine what this depending voltage is, and we can map this depending voltage across the entire sample in a completely automated manner. But here's the thing, and there's, a, there's another very interesting thing that you're seeing, is that after we apply a voltage, you can actually see the wall is actually snapping forward and then snapping backwards. So why is this happening? And the reason this is happening is because the wall is an elastic interface, and as you apply a voltage, the, the wall actually, the wall does deform a little bit, but this deformation actually results in some tension on the wall, and, the, and in order to try and reduce the elastic energy, it will try to, it will try to snap back, and that, that's, but it snaps back to a slightly new equilibrium configuration, and that's exactly what you actually measure here. So we're in the process of getting some um, statistics on this um, to try to measure the actual uh, the, the energy of that interface um, uh, by just collecting statistics here. Um, so hopefully I'll have that, but this was very recent data that we got only a couple of weeks ago. We can do more things uh, through this kind of automated, struct, uh, automated spectroscopy. We can do things like uh, create metastable states. So here, uh, what we see here is, is that uh, this is a so-called Ferrobot system where we take our AFM tip, and again, it's the same kind of FPGA device that I showed before, and we scan across this particular, in, uh, this particular domain wall in a different sample. This is the lead zirconate titanate sample. And every, every time the, the tip scans across this particular interface, it's applying a single voltage pulse. Okay, and so when it does this across the particular image, you can see after we've done this that there's a region of high or enhanced response on this side of the domain wall after this particular, uh, uh, this particular experiment. So why is that happening? And the reason that's happening is that because every time you're applying a, a voltage pulse, you are moving the wall to a frustrated configuration, and, when you, and this is sort of a higher energy configuration um, for the domain wall, and this actually leads to higher susceptibility, and if you do the calculations, which will give you more, uh, uh, electromechanical response. And so what we have done is we've basically engineered a metastable state in our ferroelectric material, which has higher response, just through nothing more than a very simple automated system. But you can't do this you know, through traditional human means, um, but you need an automated system to do this. But it just shows the power that you know, a very simple experiment that could have been done 30 years ago, right? If you just, have the, um, if you just had that automated system, uh, it's, it's perfectly possible. And the other thing is that when we, uh, if we use larger voltage pulses, you can see that the, this region of high response goes away. And the reason for that is just because for small biases, you might be able to move the do domain wall in this free energy landscape to a higher energy position. But for large biases, you would expect that it would, it would relax back to sort of a, a lower energy state because it's, it's overcome this, this large potential barrier here. And so that's exactly what we see. And so what we, what we provide here is that this automated system allows us to probe these sort of energy landscapes that previously we were not able to probe just because uh, we, we, you would have to do this manually previously and you probably not have enough statistics to actually tell you enough information about what's going on. Um, but even here, uh, we can do better, right? Instead of just probing everywhere, instead of collecting spectra everywhere, we can be smart about how we are probing and how we are using our system. And so one way to do this is, for example, we can take uh, a spectra 
at, at random positions. Let's say that instead of uh, taking a spectra at every individual location, I'm going to collect a, a spectra at random positions. And so um, I can do this, and then I can, sorry. Um, yeah, so what I can do is I can collect the spectra, and then I can upload, I can upload the spectra to some GPU server where we can then uh, run some algorithms such as ba uh, Bayesian optimization to be able to optimize for the next measurement conditions. In other words, I want to optimize for some target property. This might be something like I want to maximize the area in my spectra, uh, and then I can uh, use this target property to, uh, within the algorithm to give me a list of new measurement conditions, uh, which will then uh, run and operate on the microscope so that we can we can actually accomplish this and not have to scan and not have to collect spectra across a dense array and typically some of these spectra particularly in things like scanning tunnel microscopy it can take up to a week and not all samples will be able to withstand that there'll be drift issues there can be tip issues there can be material degradation issues and so it can be very useful um, to enable new types of experiments if we're efficient about this type of scanning um, so this is just an example of this in action. Again, this is just an image that we collected of the sample before we, we started the experiment. Uh, and this is, just, uh, this is showing what the experiment actually looks like. Um, on the left here, you see some random pixels that have been sampled. And in the middle here, you see the, a prediction from the Gaussian process regression about uh, our particular target property. And you sort of it's very broad and, and large, and you don't really see much for now. But once you get to a particular number of spectra that have been sampled, uh, you'll sort of see some localization where the kernel length scale in the GP prediction sort of uh, uh, is, is well optimized. You sort of see it there, and so you see this transition. And so what you see is that the uh, the sampling points will be around the places where the GP prediction is high, and so. If we compare this to a ground truth, what you find is that um, it, it indeed does find regions where, uh, based on the ground truth, we found regions where the spectra were, were, had maximum area, which is what we were after. Um, but you also see that there's a, there's a problem with this. Like, if you look at the ground truth versus what we actually, what the reconstruction looks like um, for our optim from our optimization, you see that it's very poor, to be honest, right? Like, we're not capturing any of the image structure. And the reason we're not capturing any of the image structure here is because the kernels that we are using in, in our Gaussian processes are basically the RBF kernels or matern kernels. It doesn't really matter. Um, but they are insufficient to describe the kinds of uh, hierarchical domain structures that we observe in photoelectric materials. And so the, the answer to that is actually something called deep kernel learning. Uh, and so this was proposed by Andrew Gordon Wilson in 2015. And so in deep kernel learning, what happens is that uh, instead of uh, using a kernel, which is like an RBF kernel with a single parameter, you use things like convolutional neural nets um, to be with learnable parameters for that particular kernel. And so what happens is that you pass the information, uh, you, you pass the data through this particular uh, convolutional neural net with learned parameters. Uh, and then um, the last layer of this is actually the GP process itself. And so we can map the sort of local uh, image structure to local image function properties through this deep kernel learning approach. And so that's exactly what we have been doing in the last couple of years uh, with this technique. And actually, if you do this, um, you find that uh, you have significantly improved performance over using traditional kernels. Is there a question? No, okay. Um, here's an example of this working in action. Um, you can see actually that this also presents some challenges in terms of implementation because these GP models take significant compute power. And so we need to run this on, on, a, on a GPU server. So we need to get the data off the instrument, pass it to a server, send it back. And this is ex exactly what's happening right now. You can see the GP running over here. This is the microscope spectra being captured. And this is, you can see on the microscope where the spectra actually being captured on the image plane. Um, we can go further than this, and we can sort of combine it with inference from trained models for things like edge detectors. So let's say that we are only interested in, in particular edges, then uh, we can uh, pass our images through these, let's say, these uh, resnets uh, or modified resnets to give us these edges. And then we can um, optimize for a particular property, um, let's say the height of this particular hysteresis loop, um, to tell us where we should be sampling along these edges to maximize this particular property, and in the process learn some physics uh, about how ferroelectric materials are behaving in the vicinity of these domain walls as well. And so you can read about that in this particular paper um, that some of my colleagues wrote recently. But the, here's the challenge, right? The challenge that we have at this point is that we have to pre-prescribe, right? Before the experiment starts, what is our target property, 
right? We can't just collect the spectra and say, I'm interested in this kind of spectra. We need a target metric. But very often we don't, right? We, we don't know what the target metric is. We are very interested in exploration of our sample. And so uh, what I thought would be very useful is to have like a rating system, right? So if we could show the user different types of spectra and say this is the, these are good spectra or these are bad spectra, can we then optimize for that particular kind of spectra? And that's exactly what we have been doing uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks. And so this is work by Arpan Biswas, who's a, who's a postdoc with us. Um, basically, this is using Bayesian optimization. Uh, again, but the thing is that we use a structural similarity index um, to, and a voting system where the user will vote, uh, and depending on how they voted um, uh, for that particular spectra, the target prop, the target spectra is actually updated, right? And so um, the user is given the option to vote, and the user is also given an option to pass. In other words, they don't, they're not going to say this is good or bad, but they're at least going to, um, they want to see more spectra before they make, make, up, make a decision. And so once this is done, um, a particular a target spectra is acquired, uh, sorry, is, is formed, and then a fully automated Bayesian optimization algorithm runs uh, for the rest of the experiment. So this is the, this is it in action. I'll just show it to you now. This is our postdoc, Yong Tao Lu, who's running the system. Um, you can see that uh, this is the spectra that's been captured, and so it just runs off a Jupyter notebook, and you, you, you vote zero, one, or two. Um, zero is for, for pa uh, pass, one is, uh, sorry, zero is bad, one is good, and two is very good. And so you can rate, just like you rate tweets or you rate Facebook posts, you can rate spectra, right? And it, it, the microscope will try and find you more spectra that agree with your likes, right? So this is, uh, I guess, uh, what's the word for epistemic closure or whatever, whatever it is where you, you only see what you like. <laughs> Um, at least that's the goal. Uh, and, and this is a really interesting and pr important problem for us because typically as scientists, we don't know what we're going to expect. But once we see a few random spectra, we can start to get an understanding, oh, this looks interesting or this looks interesting. And we don't have forever on the microscope, right? So these are limited time instruments that you get. If you're a user, you might get a week's worth of time. Do you want to use that week as best as possible? Um, but also it can give you some important inf information about where or how the microstructure is related to the to the properties themselves, right? So if we actually look at um, the particular spectra in this, the particular evolution in this case, you will see that this is the example of uh, of where the spectra are being acquired after this rating has been done. Um, you will see that in fact uh, the points that are being sampled are away from these sort of needle-like domains. And so that actually tells you that you know the the the, the features that you are finding are correlated. Um, with positions that are in these C domains rather than in these A domains, and that can actually be kind of useful um, for, for physics understanding as well. And so this is just, this is operating purely automatically on the microscope after the user has rated 15 or so spectra. So that's kind of, uh, I thought it was a fun project. <laughs> All right, anyway. And you sort of see it at the end here. Um, it, these pl this plot sh clearly shows that the number of points that are on any of these needles is quite small. And so the number of points instead that are clustered towards the center of these domains is higher. And so that's exactly what we would have expected. But here, um, we have, I've just shown you, you know, methods that can be used for sort of optimizing where we sample. I haven't shown you, can we use methods that can actually modify our material system in sort of targeted ways? And and so that's actually the next task. And um, one way we can do that is we can use something called reinforcement learning um, or reinforcement learning approaches that can help us to do this. And so I don't know how much uh, people know about reinforcement learning, and I'll just give you a very brief overview. But basically, reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning. It's neither supervised nor unsupervised. Um, it's kind of in between. But basically, uh, it involves a circumstance where you have an agent. The agent uh, performs actions based on generally partial information on an env um, that's given to them by an environment. And that environment spits back states and reward signals. And the goal of the agent in reinforcement learning is to sort of maximize the cumulative rewards that they get over time. Right? And so you can think of this as sort of the typical gameplay situation where you are trying to train an agent to play chess or you're trying to train you know, like a, an agent to play soccer or some other kind of game. Um, the goal there would be that you know, if they win, they get a 
equal plus one reward. If they lose, you get minus one reward. And the rewards are typically sparse, right? So you don't get a reward after, after every action. Um, you, so there's a lot, kind of a long time, time lag between, or delay between your actions, your actions that you take and the actual reward signal that you might, that you might uh, obtain as a result of those. And so it becomes a very high dimensional problem that requires a lot of data and a lot of compute resources. And so um, the typical sort of mathematical formulation is that um, an agent is trying to learn a policy, and a policy defines how an actor behaves um, in typically in, in RL, sort of Markov decision processes. And in MDP, this is defined, um, the policy itself is a distribution of actions over states. So given a particular state that I am in, what is the probability of taking that of a particular action, right? And so that's exactly what we are trying to learn um, in reinforcement learning. And so we can sample this policy to obtain trajectories through the Markov decision process. The trajectories are sort of state action reward sequence triples. So we can take a policy, say you should act in this way, and then we can apply it to the MDP and then sample these trajectories. And we get these sort of typically thousands or even millions of trajectories in reinforcement learning. And the goal here is to sort of max, is to solve the MDP to maximize the cumulative rewards. So I'm sampling these trajectories tau um, by uh, applying this policy uh, pi. And I have an expect, expectation about the rewards that I get for these particular trajectories, right? So how can I uh, maximize this particular objective function j? That's the, that's the goal here. Um, the typical way that this is done um, in sort of continuous action spaces is through a so-called actor critic method uh, and uh, through the policy gradient method. And so this actually provides us with, I won't go through all of the math here, but this provides us with a method here um, to be able to solve for this particular, uh, how to solve um, for the parameters theta of our particular policy pi um, so that we can uh, move in the direction towards higher objective function, right, to, to maximize this particular J. Um, the challenge with traditional actor critic or this standard policy gradient method is that it has sort of a very high variance. And so it leads to very slow convergence. And the reason um, is just because the way that the problem is set up, right? So if you, if you work in, in a particular, let's say that you know, you're playing some kind of Atari game, you might go four or five steps without having receiving any reward, and then suddenly you might receive 100 points, and then suddenly you might receive negative five points because you, know, you had to go back a step. So there's a very high variance typically in this signal, and so this leads to a very low, slow convergence. And the way that we, um, typically this has been addressed is um, uh, defining a so-called advantage function or a baseline to subtract from, the, from this uh, reward signal. Uh, and so this can be something like the value function estimate. And this is typically called the critic. Um, and so these are actually neural nets. So we have a critic that will, that will, tell, that will learn this particular value, value estimate or the value of being in a particular state. And we have another uh, uh, neural network, which is sort of the actor, which is this policy here, right? Um, and so what we want to do is we want to encourage actions that increase the so-called advantage here, right? So we want to find this uh, gradient J and we want to maximize this, sorry, we want to maximize this uh, objective function J. And so we want to be able to sort of encourage actions that increase the so-called advantage here. Um, in other words, how much better would I be by performing this action compared to what my previous baseline was? That's what this advantage is. Um, and one way to do this is a so-called Stein variational policy gradient algorithm, which was proposed in 2017 um, by, by these authors here. Um, and the idea here is that instead of learning a single, a single policy, you learn a distribution over policies um, through a variational method. And so this is the Stein variational method that they use. Um, and so uh, what this particular update term says is it basically says that we want these particular, in a Stein variational method, we have a, a number of particles that we choose let's say let's say 10 particles or you know, um, let's yeah let's say 10 particles and so what we what we want to do is we want to move these particles towards the regions where they have sort of high uh, high values uh, in our objective space, and so what we find in our yeah in our objective, and so but at the same time we want we want sufficient exploration, and so we we have a repulsive term between the particles themselves, and so that's actually what's what's shown here. The first term sort of drives the particles towards high probability regions, um, and then the second term um, is sort of uh, giving them uh, exploration, so it pushes particles away. <coughs> so our um, contribution to this particular algorithm was to sort of develop a scalable version of this algorithm, of this, SV, of this, of this uh, 
Stein variational policy gradient algorithm. Um, and so we um, converted the algorithm to from being a synchronous algorithm to being an asynchronous and load balanced algorithm, which we can actually run, actually run on high performance computing resources. Um, this is just showing you sort of without load balancing um, what the uh, how, what the time taken is for each agent. And so this is with load balancing. And basically the key here is that you want these bars to be as close to the red line as possible because that indicates there's no idle time. And so you're actually using your compute resources. And we actually use this um, to, to solve a couple of material science problems um, which I'll get to here. And so the first thing that we, that we did uh, was we, we solved this particular uh, synthesis trajectory problem with kinetic Monte Carlo simulations. Yeah. Uh, for uh, a simulated environment. So this is a, a syn synthetic environment where we are trying to uh, adjust the synthesis conditions to optimize film morphology. And so we can use this reinforcement learning um, uh, algorithm that I just mentioned uh, to uh, optimize for that and provide that particular tr synthesis trajectory. Uh, we can also do things like atomic manipulation. So here, these are molecular dynamic simulations where we want to, uh, for example, use electron beam to uh, adjust the momentum that's being transferred to dopants, in this case, silicon dopants and graphene. But this is just a molecular dynamic simulation. It's a very simple version of what we would actually see in an electron microscope. The point is that we can run this RL algorithm in this simplified space uh, to give us some insights into the, the, uh, how we would control uh, dopants in this particular system by uh, imparting momentum on this, um, through the electron beam. And then very recently, this was just published in, it's actually in press now in MLST, um, how we can move defects in uh, for electric materials, again, in a simulated environment um, so that we can optimize things like uh, uh, curl of vector fields, um, which is kind of a very interesting from the, from the for electric standpoint. But the point here is that we created this algorithm and then we applied it to some simulated cases. And then the, the point, you know, me being an experimentalist, of course, then the next question is, can we apply it to an actual experiment, right? And so I'm not saying that we have, we've got there yet, but we're gonna get close and I'm gonna show you how close we are. Um, so uh, in order to do this on an experimental, in an experimental way, what we need is we need a lot of data. And of course, because we have our automated system, we can get a lot of data. And so the way that we can do that is, for example, let's say that I want to figure out how I should apply different voltages across this domain wall to, to let's say, create designer domain wall structures or domain structures, right? We know that functional properties are very heavily affected by the type of domain walls, by the type of domain structures that you have in electrics. We don't exactly know how to control them. Um, and so maybe reinforcement learning can be, can be useful for that, particular, for, that, for that particular problem. And so in order to make this work, we need to obviously write the automation script to get some initial data, collect data on the so-called state transitions, train a surrogate model, and then train a reinforcement learning agent. So right now we are here. We have not gone to this particular stage yet, although one of our students is, is working on that now. But nonetheless, um, I'll show you the data that we do have, which is very interesting. And so here is an example that I, of data that I collected last week. Um, and so what you see here is, uh, uh, in, this is a sort of sped up data, which this data took two days to collect, but this is just, this video is, is a speed up. And what we do is um, we allow the instrument to find the domain wall and apply vo voltages of random uh, po pulse widths and amplitude, and, uh, sorry, pulse widths and amplitudes um, to the domain wall and then image the results. So what we get is we get the previous wall position, we get the, the action space, the action that we applied, and then the next state. Um, in this particular in this particular way, um, we can also uh, do this. This is just another example of the same kind of experiment. Um, I call this the machine gun video because it's like uh, we are applying a lot of pulses in a very short amount of time. Of course, this is not a short time. This is actually two days, <laughs> um, but it's sped up for you. So. It can see some very interesting phenomena that occur when, when we do this sort of experiment where, for example, repeated pulses will actually grow some needle domains from the center, um, which actually is probably related to lower nucleation energies. Um, and so you sort of see that here, for example, you know, there was no needle domain here and after in, enough pulses, it sort of started to nucleate and grow from here. Um, but we need to get faster, right? So each image here takes four minutes uh, and that's too, that's too slow. Um, how can we get faster? Um, we can get faster through spiral scans. And so here is a, uh, and compressive sensing. 
And so here is a spiral scan that we, co that we collect. Um, this is work by Marty Checker that he's currently doing. Um, we still need to optimize this. But basically what we can do is instead of taking four minutes for a scan, we can, we can take scans every second with this method. So what we do is we, we, we uh, scan a, a spiral, uh, in a spiral trajectory, and then we reconstruct what the, what the image would look like, right, through our image reconstruction algorithms. But the key here is that we need the reconstruction algorithm to work in a reasonable time scale. The reconstruction has to work in, let's say, five to ten seconds, in order, in order for us to be able to then use that for feedback, right, because every time we scan, we need feedback on the instrument so that we can determine our next action. And so this is where I think a lot of the work that we're going to do in the next couple of years is going to be. It's going to be at that intersection of how we can take the algorithms that we already have and really speed them up to be able to make them uh, useful for these kinds of applications. Anyway, we can take the data that we have and then we can sort of co collect uh, these state transitions and then make surrogate models. And so here on the left, you see sort of the initial domain wall structure after a, and then after a particular voltage application, you can see what happened. And so this is sort of the initial state and the next state in reinforcement learning terminology. This is the difference. And the question is, can we predict you know, with a neural net, you know, based on a particular given wall structure and action, what our wall structure would look like? Right? what the manipulation would actually look like. Uh, and this is what you see. You can see here that um, as a function of, of, uh, of uh, this is a trained surrogate model, um, this is a trained neural net, after we ingest all that data and, and do some training on it, uh, we can see that as we increase the voltage, excuse me, <coughs> We can see that the, the wall actually um, displaces as we'd expect. Increasing voltage pulses in, result in increasing uh, displacements, and increasing voltage uh, volt pulses in the negative side in, result in increasing ne negative displacements, exactly as you would expect. Um, and similarly, if you just look at changing the pulse width, yeah, increasing the pulse width results in the wall moving further, which is exactly as you would expect. Um, and just to confirm, this is you know this is what we what we really do uh, think is is happening. Uh, we we did some phase field modeling. Actually, this is phase field modeling by Yi Kao and and um, his student at UT Arlington. Um, Yi Kao was a former postdoc at at Oak Ridge and has become an associate professor at UT Arlington. Um, and so he uh, uh, did some facial modeling for this particular system. And so basically, the, the point that I'm trying to show is that the, they, they did the same thing that we did in the experiment through simulations. And you see that actually the, the results are quite um, qualitatively uh, match quite closely. You see the sort of asymmetry here in the, in the wall displacement as a function of position for different voltages, which is very similar to what we actually observe, which is kind of nice. Um, so, you know, as far as workflow considerations are concerned, like the next step is obviously take the surrogate model and train a reinforced learning agent on, on the surrogate model and then deploy it on the microscope, right? But I think, you know, in general, um, this is going to be a typical workflow that you're going to see in a lot of microscopy settings, right? You are going to see settings where you, you're going to try to uh, collect a lot of data, analyze the data on the fly, and then hopefully use all of that data to create uh, a system which allows you to, to have mechanistic feedback and hopefully some understanding of your material system so that you can move it towards desired trajectories or outcomes that, um, that, 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 you, that you desire. And of course, in order to do this, um, you, you really need uh, to consider the workflow in its entirety. You need uh, the compute resources to be available. You need the simulations and modeling to be available in, in, in reasonable amount of time. You consider latency requirements, inference at the edge. It all sort of merges together in this particular field. Um, so I hope you know I've given you some um, some insights into what we are doing at CNMS in, in, in our microscopy land, um, and how we can use algorithms to really accelerate and improve our scientific characterization tools. And I think the next step is really going to be, uh, hopefully the next time, you know, uh, in the next couple of years, we're gonna see improvements not only in the SPM side, but also in the electron microscopy side, as well as in the synthesis side, um, where we can perhaps um, optimize, prop, uh, optimize synthesis trajectories um, so that we can collect, create metastable states in, in materials with uh, desired functionalities. Um, with that said, I'm, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you'd like to uh, uh, reach out to me, please uh, send me an email. I'm also on Twitter at this handle. Thank you very much.